Now let us con consider another condition which is called Lewis condition of diffraction. Uh, for x-ray crystallographer everyone uses the Bragg's condition, Bragg's condition is taught even in high school, this is considered as a very, very important condition. But for solid state physics, Lewis condition turns out to be slightly more interesting and slightly more important. So, let us discuss Lewis condition. Of course, both are equivalent. It can be shown that in the case of Lewis condition can be derived from Bragg's law and vice versa. So, there is no difference, it is only the way I point to put it. I generally call that Lewis condition is you know bottoms up approach while Bragg's condition is a top down approach because what in Bragg's condition you do you first consider the lattice and then you divide into the planes and then you start studying it. Here in Lewis condition we first consider two points and then you uh, replace these two points eventually by the lattice. So, we start from the bottom just considering the diffraction condition from two points and then slowly decide that these two points will be actually a common translation vector of a lattice. So, it is a, a different approach. The final result that you get is a very, very interesting result which is very useful result for solid state physicists and this can be shown to be exactly equivalent to the Bragg's condition. So, I have said consider a lattice, but you need not consider a lattice, you can consider any two arbitrary points. So, but this is the way normally we say that consider a lattice, consider any two arbitrary points of lattice. So, I start by two arbitrary points on a lat lattice. Okay. Now, these are only the definition. Whatever is the direction of incident x-ray beam, I call this as k. So, k consists, its magnitude is 2 pi by lambda and it is in the same direction as the incident x-ray. So, this is represented the wave vector of the x-ray is considered as x and a unit vector in this particular direction, remember unit vector does not have a dimension, a unit vector in this particular direction k is written as n hat or n cap. Now, similarly, if we are getting a diffracted beam in a particular direction, that particular thing is going to be written in k prime as vector k prime. Okay. Remember, because in x-ray diffraction, we always talk of what we call as elastic scattering of x-rays. So, we assume that lambdas are not changing, the energy of the photon or wavelength of the x-ray does not change. So, the magnitude of k and k prime is same, only its direction would become different. The x-ray beam will now move, go in a different direction and let that particular direction be specified by a unit vector n prime. So, this is only a definition. So, I consider only two points here, they are just two points and let us suppose this is my incident beam coming which is parallel beam coming here and my d is not very clear here, uh, the d is pointing this way, this is the d. So, this is the arrow of the d, this is the end of the arrow. So, my vector is going this way, d vector was going this way, alright. So, the thing is that if this is, these are the two vectors, uh, two points which are separated by a vector d. Let us suppose an x-ray is incident, the wave vector of which is given as k. Find out what is the condition that a Bragg reflected beam comes or a diffracted beam comes with k prime in this particular direction. Remember again magnitude of k is same as magnitude of k prime. So, I am just looking for the condition that what happens if I get, I get a diffracted beam in k prime direction, when these two points are just a, separated by a vector t. So, this is the condition that I am going to write. Okay, you have to be careful in this particular thing because we are mixing two ideas, d is in the direct lattice space and k is in the reciprocal lattice space, but as I said you can always draw something by taking an appropriate unit. So, these dimensions I am not particularly looking at, it is basically looking specifically specifying the directions. Let us just define certain angles. So, let this particular angle be phi and let this particular angle be theta. So, let us not confuse between the uh, Bragg's angle, okay. these are just two angles at this particular moment, let us not consider them in any different fashion. Okay. So, let us suppose this is the angle theta which is this is the vector d, this is the vector k, this is the vector k prime, this is the vector k prime and this is the angle phi, this theta and phi need not be same because I am looking for an arbitrary direction k prime and find out the condition that you will get actually a constructively diffracted beam in this particular direction. So, I have just taken theta and phi. Okay. Let us try to find out the path difference between these two. If I try to find the path difference, what I will do from this particular point, I will drop a perpendicular here, I will drop a perpendicular here. All right. So, this particular beam which comes here travels an additional distance of this and this particular distance. So, this particular beam 
travels a larger distance and that path difference is going to be given by this expression and as you know that if this particular path difference turns out to be equal to a constant uh, an integer times lambda then only I will get a constructive interference. So, let us calculate this path difference because this is theta this is 90 degree. So, this particular distance which is additional distance is d which is the magnitude of d ok into cos theta while this particular thing because this is phi this is equal to d this thing angle is 90 degree. So, this is equal to d cos phi. So, total path difference will be d cos theta plus d cos phi I hope this is clear ok. Remember I mean we similarly calculated path difference when we are also calculating Bragg's law, but then they were we are calculating the path difference between two planes. Here I am just taking two points ok. So, I am starting from two points. Now, let us try to express this in terms of unit vectors. So, as I said n is the unit vector in the same direction as k and n prime is a unit vector in the same direction as k prime. So, this will be the direction of n prime. So, this will be the direction of minus n prime because n prime is in the same direction as k prime. So, this is minus n prime all right. So, this d cos theta this distance you can see can be written as d dot n because d dot n will be d multiplied by n multiplied by cos theta. So, this is the direction of d this was the direction of d this is the direction of n ok. So, the angle between d and n is this theta which is same as this theta all right. So, magnitude of n is of course, unity. So, d dot n will be actually equal to d cos theta. Similarly, if I write this particular thing d cos phi this particular term ok. Actually, the angle phi is angle between n prime and d because this is the d vector and this is n prime vector ok. So, this is the angle which is phi. So, therefore, I should take d dot minus n prime which is what I have written here all right. So, this will be the path difference. So, let us use this particular path difference. So, overall path difference will be d dot n minus n prime and it must be equal to an integer times lambda. I have written m here because I have used n here. So, makes no difference. Now, what I do I multiply this particular thing is by, by 2 pi by lambda. If I multiply right hand side by 2 pi by lambda, lambda will go away and this will become 2 pi multiplied by m. And if I multiply this by, by 2 pi by lambda, this will have the magnitude of the wave vector which remember lambda is same for in incoming x-ray as well as outgoing x-ray. So, you will have 2 pi by lambda which will give you k, this will give you k prime. So, this becomes the d t dot k minus k prime is equal to 2 pi m, which essentially means that if I take an exponential of these two factors, then e raise power i d dot k minus k prime exponential of this factor must be equal to exponential of 2 pi m. Okay. We have discussed earlier in the lecture today that e raise power 2 pi m is actually equal to 1. So, this particular factor will actually turn out to be equal to 1 ok. So, it means Bragg diffraction condition or rather Lewis condition says that diffraction from two points will be constructive and you will get an emerging beam or diffracted beam in k prime direction provided e raise power i d dot k minus k prime is equal to 1. Now, at this point we said that I have taken only two points now consider the entire lattice. Now, lattice consists of a large number of points rather infinite number of points ok and all these thing points are separated you can draw similar type of pairs by taking any two arbitrary points of a lattice. So, let these two points be any two arbitrary points of the lattice ok. In case you are going to get Bragg diffraction in this particular direction k prime then with respect to all these pairs not only these I have just considered one pair ok consider all these pairs for all these pairs I must get this condition equal to 1. It means instead of this particular d if I replace it by any translation vector of direct lattice ok. See remember two points any two points of a direct lattice are separated by a translation vector t. This is what we have started yesterday ok. Now, take any two points ok difference between them ok will be represented by a translation vector t. Okay. So, if this d is replaced by any translation vector t and still this condition is satisfied then only you will get a Bragg diffraction from the entire lattice all right. It means this condition must get satisfied even when d is replaced by t where t is any direct translation vector of direct lattice. This condition must be satisfied for any general translation vector of the direct lattice hence we must have e raise power i t dot k minus k prime equal to 1. Now, 
if you remember when we talked about the properties uh, reciprocal lattice, we said that it so happens that E raise for i g dot t turns out to be equal to 1. So, if I want this particular condition to be satisfied, then all that you want that k minus k prime should be equal to any translation vector of reciprocal lattice, that is what is important. In fact, in the Bragg's condition, in the Lois condition, you talk in terms of reciprocal lattice vectors, while in the uh, in the Bragg's language you talk in terms of planes, ok. That is what links these two Lois condition and the Bragg condition. So, you must have k minus k prime must be equal to g. So, what it says that if the wave vector difference between the incident and the diffracted beam turns out to be equal to any reciprocal lattice, any translation vectors in the reciprocal lattice, in that particular case you will find out that Bragg reflection condition or the diffraction condition for constructive diffraction will get satisfied. So, as I said, Lois condition can be shown to be equivalent to Bragg's condition, both can be derived from each other, ok. Important thing is that here we are talking of reciprocal lattice vectors, not lattice planes. So, what was being talked in terms of lattice planes in the Bragg condition is now being talked in terms of the reciprocal lattice vectors. Uh, this is one thing which I just will casually mention because we are not really having a course on solid state physics. See, if you remember when we are talking about the quantum mechanics course at that time we said that h cross k represents the momentum of a photon, of course, it also represents the momentum uh, of a free particle. Okay. Now, this condition can also be written as the condition for the momentum. Okay. So, what happens if you multiply this by h cross k? Okay. So, it becomes change in the momentum of the photon. Momentum will of the photon will change by the amount h cross k minus h cross k prime. Okay. So, what it essentially says that the change of momentum of the photon must be equal to h cross g, where g is a reciprocal lattice vector. Of course, in this particular case, these momenta are real momentum and um, you will uh, find out that this particular momentum uh, because momentum has to be conserved. So, whatever this momentum you know wherever your crystal is mount that will experience this particular recoil. Of course, this is very small. So, and this particular um, crystal is tightly bound or rigidly bound to the machine. So, you will never see this particular recoil, but if you are talking from the physics point of view of course, the system will get recoil. What I want to say that this is actually a precursor to a what we call as a general conservation of crystal momentum equation. In solid state physics you get many type of elementary excitation. For example, excitations like phonons, okay, excitations like magonons, okay, each one of them represent can be represented by a wave vector. For that matter, even electrons inside a lattice, what we call as a block electron. I am not sure probably maybe Professor Suresh will talk little bit about when he talks about solid state physics. Okay. So, all these things are represented by wave vector and many times h cross k does not represent their actual physical momentum. Okay. We define a quantity which is called crystal momentum which is called h cross k irrespective of what type of excitation that we are talking okay, because that excitation will always have a wave vector. Okay. And what essentially is a generalized equation of conservation of what we call as crystal momentum. In fact, in solid state physics what we use is the conservation of crystal momentum which says that summation of all incident crystal momentum and summation of all final crystal momentum they can differ only by h cross g or g could be 0 also which essentially means that in that particular case the crystal momentum is exactly conserved. Okay. But this is anyway just a sort of precursor to that thing. Again, if, uh, if you are not interested in solid state physics or you know you need not bother about this particular thing, but it is important to specify to the student that why solid state physicists talk about Lois condition and take this Lois condition as very, very rigorous and important condition because this turns out to be a precursor of a much more fundamental conservation law which happens within the crystals. Now, there is a corollary to this particular thing which let me just try to take, just expressing this particular term into a slightly different form. Uh, Lois condition we have though it is explicitly assumed that the magnitude of k and magnitude of k prime is same, but it has not been used in the mathematical form. I mean it has been used in its derivation, okay, but in the mathematical form it is not very clear. So, there is a different way of putting this particular Lois condition where we take into care the fact that k prime and k their magnitude is same. So, this is expressed only in terms of k and we sort of remove k prime, okay, we eliminate k prime. So, all that I do I write k prime is equal to k plus g here and then square it 
square in the terms of vector means that you take a dot product of the vector with its own self. So, if you take the dot product you will get k prime square, here you will get k square because g is on the other side you will get g square minus 2 k dot g because there is a k prime I am writing here. So, this was k minus g, so you will get minus 2 k dot g. Now, the magnitude of k prime and k prime k square has to be same because we know that the wavelengths do not change in a standard Bragg refraction. So, this get cancelled out. So, you write this equation as k dot g okay, and take 2 on this particular factor is half g alright. Now, take this g as the magnitude of this thing. So, if you divide by the magnitude of this particular g, this you can write as k dot g where g is a unit vector in the direction of g. So, in other words, the Lewis condition can be written in the fact that if you have a wave vector k, then if k dot g turns out to be equal to half g, then the condition of Bragg diffraction would satisfy. It. Now, this particular equation can be represented in terms of some sort of a geometrical way of expressing these things which we call as Brillouin zones. As I said, Brillouin zone uh, after reciprocal lattice is the very, very important concept in solid state physics. Of course, I will not be able to justify it by this particular thing. I will only mention why this particular thing is essential. Okay. So, let us see how do we use this particular thing. Now, remember the difference in this Lewis condition is that we are always talking in reciprocal lattice space. You know, k has also dimension of inverse of length, g also has a dimension of inverse length. See, k has a dimension of 2 pi by lambda, which is dimension of inverse of length. So, all these things, all these figures that we are going to make is now in reciprocal lattice space, where everything is of the dimension of inverse of length. So, let us suppose this is my reciprocal lattice. No, now this is not the direct lattice, but this is the reciprocal lattice. Okay, let us take one particular point as origin. I think I have taken this particular point as origin and try to geometrically express this particular condition of Bragg reflection or rather Lewis condition in a, in a pictorial form. So, let us take at this particular origin. So, let us take this and take one of its nearest neighbor. So, this is my origin. So, I have taken this as the nearest neighbor. So, what I do? I draw in principle of course, two dimensions. So, I draw a line which bisects the line joining these two perpendicularly bisects. So, I take I join these two particular point okay. then draw a line which is perpendicular to this line all right and bisects it. So, I mean this is equal to this. In three dimension I will draw a plane which bisects this particular thing normally. It means this particular plane is this particular direction is normal to this particular plane. If you can assume third dimension looking on this side and behind the paper and front of the paper going ahead. Then this will be a plane and this particular plane will be no, this particular direction will be normal to this particular plane in such a way that this distance and this distance is same. So, let us suppose I draw a plane like this. Okay. Well, how does it help? Let us see. Now, let us start from this particular origin point. Let us write a wave vector and let us suppose the wave vector is such that this wave vector if I draw from this particular point, remember this has the same dimension. So, g also has a reciprocal lattice also has a dimension of inverse of length and k also has a dimension of inverse of length. So, I can draw this particular thing exactly without any further convention. Only convention which I have to use or which uh, only units which I have to take uh, or scale which I have to take is when I am drawing the reciprocal lattice. Once I have chosen that scale, using the same scale I can draw k also on that particular thing. So, I draw k in this particular direction. If it so happens that k the tip of the k ends just on anywhere on this particular plane. I insist that condition will get satisfied. Condition which I have written earlier, which is this condition k dot g is equal to half g. So, because a this particular has g, so this the g has a unit vector g has in this particular direction. So, if I talk take k dot g, this particular thing is theta different uh, angle between k and g. So, k dot g will be equal to just this, okay, which will turn out to be equal to half g. Okay. So, if it so happens that using this origin, I draw the incident wave vector k starting from this particular point, then if it so happens that this vector terminates exactly anywhere on this particular plane, then k dot g will be just equal to this much and this will automatically turn out to be equal to half g and then Bragg condition will get satisfied. But this Bragg condition gets satisfied or rather Lewis condition I am sort of repeatedly sometimes mentioning these are equivalent. Okay. Now, this is satisfied only for this g, but then I must take all other values of g 
to realize whether this condition is going to be satisfied or not. It means I need not take only this particular thing, I will take another nearest neighbor, another nearest neighbor, then I should go to the next nearest neighbors and keep on doing it forever. Okay? And if it so happens that if I take a value of k, if I know my incident x-ray beam, I know its wavelength, I know its direction with respect to the crystal that I have mounted it, all right? then in that particular case, in principle, I will be, and if it so happens that this k terminates exactly in any of these planes, let us call them Bragg planes, if it terminates exactly in any of these Bragg planes, then only you will get a constructive x-ray diffraction, otherwise you will not get. So, let us take the second line now. So, this is, now I have taken this as my second nearest neighbor, I draw this particular line. Then take this, there is a third nearest neighbor which has exactly the same distance, I draw this line here. Then I take this one and draw the another line. So, I draw another line here by taking this. Now, it has four nearest neighbors, I am talking of only two dimensional here, three dimensional you will have other nearest neighbors also which you can draw similar type of thing, it does not matter. Okay. Let us look for two dimension where things are easy, I mean these things can be extended for three dimensions easily. All right. Now, let us start second nearest neighbor, second nearest neighbor will be this, because this is a sort of a square structure. If, if I take perpendicular bisector, it will go like this. Then I will take the second nearest neighbors. So I take the second nearest neighbor, this I draw a line like this. Actually, this thing should pass exactly through this particular point. Okay. Then I take another nearest neighbor, which is here, next nearest neighbor. Then I take this as nearest neighbor, I will get this particular thing. Then I will get another nearest neighbor, which is this thing, you get this particular line. Then I take second nearest neighbor, second nearest neighbor is this thing, third nearest neighbor rather. Okay, this will be this. So, I must draw a line like this, which is perpendicular bisector to this particular, this particular G. Okay. I have drawn multiple of them together. So, now you are getting multiple lines, you know, it is essentially a mess when you keep on going to higher and higher things. Okay. So, we define certain zones out of this, okay, which is, I mean, I mean, of course, in a realistic case, you know what will be the typical order of magnitude of k. So, after a certain thing, you do not have to go to the larger nearest neighbors. But as I said, this concept is of great use. So, let us define certain things which we call as Brillouin zones. So, this is what we define as Brillouin zone. A volume in the reciprocal lattice space, of course, in two dimension, it will be area. A volume in reciprocal lattice space is called nth Brillouin zone if all the points within it except boundary of course, if joined to the origin cross exactly n minus 1 planes or in two dimension n one minus 1 lines, no fewer, no larger. Then what is the significance of this particular thing below zones? If the tip of incident wave, wave vector drawn from origin lands exactly on the surface of any below zone, it will suffer a diffraction, otherwise no. Okay. It has to exactly land on one of the surfaces of any of the Blois zones. All right. So, let us draw a few Blois zones. So, this was my original picture which I have done. If you take any point here, okay, if you join this to origin, it does not cross any line. Okay. So, it is first Blois zone. This area will be considered as first Blois zone. Okay. Because any point within it, if you draw to the origin, does not cross any of these lines. Well, if you take this particular point, this particular area, if you join any point from here to this particular origin, it will cross exactly one point, only one line, you will cross only this line. So, this area will be a part of what we call as second Blois zone. Okay. If you take any particular point here, okay, if it crosses here from example here to here, then it will cross this particular line, it will cross, uh, I mean, let us take somewhere here. Okay. It will cross this line, it will cross this line, it will cross two lines. So, this will be point in third Blois zone. Okay. Of course, if you look at any textbook, you, know, you find multiple number of Blois zones drawn very, very beautifully. So, I have just tried to put it approximately. This is my first Blois zone. Okay. Any point within this, when drawn, when joined to the origin, will cross no lines or no planes, no Bragg planes. This will be my second Blois zone because once any point is joined to here, it will cross exactly one point or rather one plane. This will be my third Blois zone because any point when joining to the origin will cross exactly two points. So, you can see that you can keep on drawing various type of Blois zones. In fact, if you look at the any standard textbook, you will find many Blois zones being drawn 
corresponded to this. Now, if you have any blue zone, for example, you have uh, this blue zone, okay, you, if you draw a wave vector k, if it ends exactly here, exactly here, not anywhere in between, it must end exactly at the surface of this, then only the condition for k uh, of Bragg diffraction or Lois diffraction condition will get satisfied and you will get a Bragg reflection. Now, it is very clear that if you just take everything arbitrarily, if you take a single crystal, okay, you have just arbitrary value of lambda, you know, these lambdas do not come into clean numbers. Okay, the, I mean, for example, you take a copper K alpha 1.54 angstrom, okay, you take okay, K, that is constants also come uh, in some arbitrary numbers. Chances they, they, they will match that 2 pi by lambda will exactly hit at one of the um, zone uh, surfaces, it is very, very unlikely. So, that is the reason I was telling that you actually require, you are required to vary something continuously in order that you have a diffraction condition satisfied. Now, what is the importance of the blue zone? As I said that normally we have various type of excitation solid state physics like phonons which are lattice vibration, you have magnons which are excitation of you know, magnetic ex excitation. So, with all these excitations you can assign a wave vector and it so happens that wave vector only in the first blue zone are of importance because of the translation symmetry. Okay, this again I am not showing. Okay, this only when we do a proper solid state phase course, we talk about this particular things, you will find only the wave vectors within the first blue zone need be considered. For example, if you want to describe the band structure of a material, like say semiconductor or for that matter any material, the wave vector which are of importance, wave vectors of the electrons which are of importance are only those which are lying in the first blue zone. Okay, all other values of k can always be translated back to the first blue zone by choosing an appropriate reciprocal lattice vector. So, this particular thing turns out to be extremely important. Also, I want to say that if you are taking a three, a three dimensional arbitrary lattice, okay, for example, let us say in body centered cubic or face centered cubic, these blue zones in three dimension, other than of course, simple cubic, which turns out to be simple, other lattices it can be fairly complex, and then you have to consider these blue zones whenever you are considering any elementary excitation within a solid. So, that is why the concept of blue zone and concept of reciprocal lattice is a sort of bread and butter for any solid state physics. So, that is the reason they are always introduced right in the beginning. Now, let us consider the effect of basis. We do not have too much of time, but let me just start talking that you know both these Lois condition and Bragg conditions talked only of the diffraction from points. We have said that actually X rays are not diffracted from points, okay, X rays are diffracted from wherever the electrons are lying there and electrons where they lie, there is a probability of finding electron at a given point from their let us say center of the atom okay, and that particular probability would depend on the wave function. Okay. And wave function to find out the wave function of a complicated element is not all that simple task, okay. but nevertheless I mean if you are really interested in finding out how the X-ray diffraction taking is taking place, okay, then you have to look in you have to find out that wave function and specifically if you are looking at the intensity of the X-ray beam, you have to find out how these electrons are distributed across these particular lattice points. Okay. But what is interesting is that you can separate out two different effects. One is what is called atomic form factor, another is what we call is a structure factor. See remember we have said that many times we put multiple number of atoms or multiple number of ions at each of these lattice points. Okay, it need not be, I mean in material, like simple material like um, uh, no, uh, elemental material like uh, let us say sodium or uh, iron or copper or whatever it is, okay, you are putting only one particular atom at one particular lattice point. But we have said the concept of basis is used in three different contexts, taking, okay, con taking a non Bravi lattice, trying to make it a, a Bravi lattice. The second thing is that make a more complicated Bravi lattice into a simpler Bravi lattice. Okay. In all these cases, the effect of basis has to be considered. So, what we do in this particular case, we separate this problem. Fortunately, it is possible to separate this particular problem. I will not be able to derive in this thing because of the lack of the time, but you can look at any standard book on uh, solid state physics. They will talk about the X-ray diffraction, how does this particular intensity or what we call a structure factor, how, how this particular overall uh, in, uh, the amplitude of uh, diffracted beam can be separated out in the form of atomic form factor and structure factor. Okay. So, you consider separate out as atomic form factor which essentially talks about the distribution of electrons or scattering particles or whatever they are okay, across the center of the atom and second thing that we talk how the different atoms or bases are placed with respect to a given lattice point. All right. If you do that particular thing then in principle 
uh, okay, the things of which are totally related to the structure can be separated out from the point of view atomic form factor. Now, calculation of atomic form factor is a much more complicated thing, but structure factor can be easily found out because you can know how these particular atoms are placed with respect to a particular point on the Bravi lattice. Okay. Now, using just this concept of structure factor, many times you can find out lot of information about the material and this is what I am going to describe briefly in another 4 to 5 transparencies. Now, let us just take a specific example. Let us consider a cubic structure and express body centered cubic lattice as simple cubic lattice with two atom spaces and a face centered cubic lattice as a simple cubic lattice with four atom spaces. This is what I have said is normally done. This also emphasizes that because you can take the unit cell in the form of cube which is much more simple and it emphasizes the symmetry of the particular lattice. So, as I say generally express as simple cubic lattice with basis. This is very helpful especially in X-ray diffraction. So, I take BCC as a simple cubic lattice and FCC as simple cubic lattice with 4 atoms basis. Okay. The advantage if I do that, okay, if I start with a unit cell which is um, simple cubic, in that case okay, the distance between planes which have the Miller indices HKL can be easily found out. Unfortunately, I will not be able to derive these things. Okay. Uh, just find it, express these things and your Bragg condition becomes this particular thing. Now, what happens that you can show from the structure factor calculation that if you are having a simple cubic material, then all reflections, I mean I am using word reflection, but it is actually diffraction as I said many times we miss you, for all the planes are permitted. Then if it happens to be body centered cubic, then H plus K plus L should be even, only then they will be permitted. If it happens to be face centered cubic, H, K, L all should be individually even or individually odd, then only they will be permitted, otherwise they will be absent. So, by looking at the pattern, you can find out whether your structure is simple cubic, body centered cubic or face centered cubic. That is what is the interesting aspect about this particular structure factor calculation, which is taking only the, uh, the positions of the atoms, okay, starting from a Bravi lattice, position of the various atoms in the basis. Okay. Remember, if I have to calculate the intensity properly, then I have to also calculate the atomic form factor, which is a much more difficult task. I must know how the electrons are getting diffracted because there are different points with the atom where the electrons are could be present and the diffraction would amount, okay, a phase difference will amount also of some sort of interference between the waves which are being transmitted or which are being diffracted from different parts of the atom. So, that also has to be accounted which is much more difficult problem. All right. So, let us just take an example and uh, let me first uh, give you these values. So, let us call this n as h square plus k square plus l square. All right. And let us look at what are the possibilities of h k l. So, the lowest number n is h k l is equal to n is equal to 1, which corresponds to h is equal to 1, k is equal to 0 and l is equal to 0. This particular reflection from this particular plane will be allowed, a is allowed not absent, a is allowed, is allowed in simple cubic, but it is not allowed in BCC because 1 plus 0 plus 0 is odd. Remember 0 is always taken as even and 1 is odd and 0 and 0 is even, so it is also not allowed for face centered cubic. Then 2 which is corresponding to 1 1 0, for simple cubic all are allowed. For body centered cubic 1 plus 1 plus 0 is 2 which is even, so this particular reflection will be present in BCC. While in the FCC it will be absent because 1 and 1 both are odd and 0 is even. So remember in FCC all three of them should either be, all three of them are should be odd or all three of them should be even. Okay. While in BCC some of them should be even, if some of them is odd this will not be allowed. 3 is 1 1 1, so for 1 1 1 you can see because all three of them are individually odd, one is also odd, one is also odd, one is also odd, so this will be allowed in FCC. But 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3 which is odd, so this will not be allowed in FCC, in BCC. So, in fact, you can see this particular table, 7 of course cannot be expressed as sum of 3 integers, h square plus k square plus l square where h, k, l are all integers cannot be equal to 7, so this cannot be present. Okay. Anyway, so you can look at various things okay, and find out from this particular table, you can draw this particular table to larger thing and find out which are the reflections which are present and which are the reflections which are not absent in a, in a, in a particular lattice. So, I am just giving one particular example how to take I mean, this a typical example which we have taken from uh, now some x-ray diffraction um, probably given in some book. So, let us suppose we are getting diffraction at various values of thetas for a particular material. Okay. This is the values of thetas corresponding to which I have found out Bragg diffraction. First, I calculate sin square theta. Why I calculate sin square theta? because this sin square theta is going to be proportional to lambda square 
which is the wavelength square divided by lattice constant square 4a square multiplied by h square plus k square plus l square. So, I must know what are the values of hkl only then I can find out 4a. Now, looking at various patterns I have to actually individually find out what are the values of hkl that is what is called indexing effort of a x-ray diffraction. Sorry, I will take another 5 minutes just to explain this particular thing. So, you take sin square theta, so these will be the values of sin square theta. Now, you try to take various ratios of this particular thing. If you take this divided by this, you find out that this thing matches 4 by 3. So, chances are that this will be 1 1 1 plane and this will be 2 0 0 plane. Okay. Let me just mention at one particular point that you know uh, earlier when we were talk talking about Miller indices, we have said that a common place is not allowed here. So, if when 1 1 0 and 2 2 0 planes are exactly the same plane. So, why we in x-ray diffraction we write 2 2 0. Actually at that time I had also mentioned that in x-ray diffraction we do talk of planes which are the common planes. Uh, let me without any more sort of uh, uh, you know sort of uh, derivation about this particular thing. Let me just uh, that is as the convention of Bragg diffraction is concerned. Second order diffraction from 1 1 0 plane will be termed as a 2 2 0 diffraction. Second order reflection from 1 1 1 plane will be reflected, will be written as 2 2 2. When I say 4 0 0 plane, it means it is a fourth order diffraction from 1 0 0 plane. So, that is the way we write it. So, effectively, you take the ratios of these things and try to find out which are the ratios which will fit these ratios of sin square theta value. And then you can look at this particular thing, okay. And then here you can see that there is a 1 1 1 present and there is a 2 0 0 plane which is present, okay, this is typical reflection of FCC lattice. So, this particular material is actually a phase centered cubic lattice, okay. So, looking at these particular sin square thetas, you can find out what type of structure you have. And of course, once you have indexed this, you know h square plus k square plus l square, you can also find out what is the value of lattice constant. Just last few transparencies, some of the utilities, I have said some of the utilities because X-ray is a very powerful technique used in for a varieties of things, okay. I will just, uh, I am very, very briefly try to mention. It is a very, very powerful technique can be used to obtain many information. In fact, you are getting better and better x-ray machines which can give you much better information about so many things. Okay, you can talk about stresses, strains and so many things. Okay, the texture, the texture is one of the very, very important aspect that we discuss especially when you are talking of you know, minerals or for example steel. Okay, so for example, if you have presence of various phases, if your material is a mixture of two different type of crystalline structure, then the relative concentration can be found out, their texture and orientation can be found out, how do you align a single crystal that can be done, okay, in fact, obtaining lattice constant. But if you talk of the most common things which most of our students do, most of our PhD students do, two things which are done very, very commonly, I think very, very large number of time, we use x-rays only for one of these two things, okay, one is to check whether you have formed a phase. If you have generated a material, if you have created a material, okay, you would like to know whether this particular material is a single phase. It means whether it has only one crystal structure or you have got some impurities. Okay, It can be checked by x-rays to find out whether you are getting a single phase material or not. Okay, uh, For all standard materials, okay, there is something which is called JCPDS data. These are cards which are now available in the form of you know softwares. Okay, You can have these particular cards and you can match your theta values and find out whether your structure is really resembling one of the standard structure for any of the material. Okay, Then to determine the structure of unknown material that is also many times done that you have generated purely new material and you have no idea of the structure. Okay, If you have no clue of the structure whether it is cubic or non-cubic or whatever it is, that is not a very simple thing. Okay, Many times people use softwares now to find out what is the structure. The last thing which I would just like to mention, this is, I mean, this is one of the students which we have taken uh, this particular data so from our group, okay. Just to show how typical theta, theta, two theta curves looks like. Remember here, things are always plotted as a function of two theta. These are the in intensities which are arbitrary like things and you get various peaks here which shows reflections from or diffractions from various planes and eventually you have to index and find out what are the planes from which these indexes, index uh, reflections are coming. The important thing here is that you are getting two mixture of two different phases which we call a zinc ferrite and cobalt ferrite which are coming and you can see a small splitting on this particular x, uh, x diffracted beam which actually refers to this particular two of uh, being two phases present. It's just to give you idea of how these particular x ray diffraction things look like. So, that is the end of this particular thing. So, if you have, I mean, we have already exceeded time, but you know, two or three questions probably we can just quickly take here. STM College, yes. Hello, sir. Yeah. Hello, good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, uh, yeah, 
the 14 brevis uh, lattices are there yes. uh, in seven crystal systems. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in some system, yes. we have all types of unit cells. In simple cubic, uh, BCC, FCC, and base center. Yeah, that's but it. in some uh, system like monoclinic and triclinic, we have only simple cubic. That's right. So we don't have other types of unit cell. That's right. What is the reason for that? Sir? See, these, as I say, these, if you are looking at the reasons, this have to be found out from what we call as group theory. See, basically, the thing is that. Um, you can show that if you look at that particular structure, you can, gen I mean, see, uh, if you take, for example, triclinic, I mean, let, let's like put it like that. In terms of general lattice constant, there are six lattice constants, which we call as A, B, C, and alpha, beta, gamma, which are the angles, okay? So, in principle, there are sort of six uh, constants which define a particular lattice. Now, it can happen that if they take a specific values, then the symmetry of that particular lattice changes. If the symmetry of that particular lattice changes, we classify this into a separate lattice. Okay, that's one aspect. The second aspect is that many times, for example, if you say that why not take face centered, let's say cubic. If you take face centered cubic, this can also by, by re-looking into different fashion can be classified as a different lattice and it does not change the symmetry. So these particular things as I call are sort of group theoretical way of looking into it where you look at all the symmetry operations and from that you find out what are the symmetry operations which are common, okay, then define crystal systems. And in that crystal system, what additional points that you can put it so that essentially symmetry is not altered. All right. On the other hand, if for example, if you take a triclinic uh, and put some, let's say, base centered, you may eventually generate some other lattice which is exactly the same time, and you are not you are not trying to talk of any further symmetry enhancement. Okay. So, yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, there are fourteen various lattices. Yeah. Only that much is there. If uh, in future or something possible, is it possible to develop some more? Or only is depending upon group theory or mathematics? Yes. So this can be mathematically shown. It seems from I am not a group theoretical person, but group theory it can be shown that only possibility exists are of fourteen. You cannot have anything addi additional than other than fourteen. All right. Now out of these fourteen, it's a different question whether you have crystals which have all those fourteen symmetries. They may not have. I am not very aware. Okay, as I said, most of the crystals generally hap happen to have a cubic symmetry or hexagonal symmetry. Of course, I know of systems which are, you know, um, for example, triclinic, uh, no, not triclinic, but monoclinic, uh, uh, tetragonal, okay, rhombohedric. There, there are certain types of structures, there are certain materials which crystallize in that. But I am not sure whether you have materials which crystallize in all 14 of them, I am not very sure. Yes. College of Engineering, Bhuvaneshwar. Why polycrystalline materials are more stable than single crystalline materials? What is the actual vision? No, no, that's not a question of being stable. I think they are equally stable if you can make them. The question is that, I mean, that's what is my feeling in general. Uh, thing is that to make a single crystal materials, you require special efforts. And what you try, which you normally make is polycrystalline material. Okay. Uh, if you have to grow a single crystal, specifically if you have to grow a high quality single crystal, okay, it requires a lot of effort because you don't want the, I mean, whenever you are generating the material, as we call it as a nucleation, you have to have only single nucleation across that particular point, you know, you should have the entire structure built in. So, you require very specialized technique to generate uh, single crystals. So, which, I mean, basic, let, let me put it like that. Uh, I mean, generally you will find it is much more expensive to build good quality single crystals. So, in fact, many of the applications that people envisage, they envisage on the polycrystalline materials and, and because the applications are, which, which are, which turn out to be cheaper. And because the applications are envisaged for polycrystalline materials, people on the other hand work, tend to work also more on polycrystalline material. But if you want to study some of the fundamental properties, you really require good quality single crystal materials. And those people, I mean, uh, growing a good quality single crystal is an art. Not everyone can do it. But I do not think it is related to stability of the material. Yeah. So can you give the physical example of a reciprocal lattice? Can I give an example of a reciprocal lattice? I had given yeah, you an yeah. example that, you know, um, uh, for example, if a body centered cubic lattice, the reciprocal is a face centered cubic. What type of example are you looking? See, remember, reciprocal lattice is something which is in a, in a reciprocal lattice space. Okay, this is what you have to imagine, you know, putting, assume that this is three dimensional graph paper. Okay, so you assume that these are points spaced in a three dimensional graph paper. Like, for example, a two dimensional reciprocal lattice I have just drawn on a paper. All right. So, only thing the length that I have taken is of dimension of inverse of length. I am not sure whether I have explained it or not. So, what is space group? Okay. 
these are a space group and point groups these are again you know group theoretical uh, things okay which essentially looks at the symmetrical aspects including the translation symmetry and this uh, I, mean, I am not very sure so I should not be answer something which, which is wrong but these are essentially group theoretical models to describe a particular type of symmetry operations including in this particular lattice okay. So these are sort of group theoretical language which people use which tells you I mean, I mean using a particular space group you can find out what are the symmetry aspects a particular space group is defined how many type of mirror symmetry you have how much of rotational symmetry you have all those things are described in that particular thing. Yeah, so which one is more advantageous, polycrystalline material or single crystalline? See, the thing is that if you want to study basics physics, then single crystal is much more useful because that actually shows a regular arrangement and you can really study whatever aspects that we want to study. But as I said, to grow a good quality single crystal material is much more expensive. So, I mean, commonly, if you are people you are using in a commercial application, I mean, of course, I can imagine, you know, I mean, for example, many of the semiconductor devices, you are using semiconductor single crystals, okay. But, you know, semiconductor, at least the growth of semiconductor single crystals have been, you know, uh, no, have been, because of their applications have been very, very well you know, utilized. But if you take any arbitrary material, okay, generally you will not find it very easy to grow a single crystal material, at least in my area, which is of magnetic materials, okay. You do not, I mean, there are hardly any applications which you envisage using single crystal material, okay, because they are so expensive to do other than magnetic bubbles you know when people are talking about single stand material and eventually they lost only because you know they were too expensive okay most of the time we use materials which are polycrystalline so unless you are looking for very very specific application people generally because they are cheaper you know eventually the word unfortunately or fortunately is ruled by economics it depends on whether the you know uh, the application uh, how cheap is the application you know the, what you are going to industrialize you know, okay uh, mgm college of engineering nanded uh, sir, uh, yesterday you have shown that how non-bravious lattice becomes to be as a bravious lattice. That's right. That's right. Uh, my question, uh, my question is: Is yeah. it possible that uh, uh, sorry, basis uh, uh, basis is simply a group of atoms? We can say yeah. then uh, that basis can make a primitive unit cell to a non-primitive unit cell, and also. Uh, uh, so, uh, loosely packed, uh, loosely packed structure to a closely packed structure, and in that way, how the coordination number is going to be becoming to be like that? No, no. See, I'm, I'm not very clear about the question that you are talking. See, the the thing is that, uh, see, when we are talking of close packed structures, we have been talking of close packed structures in which we are talking of single atoms. Okay. When you have multiple atoms, when you have a complicated type of material, for example, the type of material which I have been working on, let us say ferrites which have you know, at least three different components, okay, how these atoms and ions are going to, fi to be fitted okay, may not really be in exactly close packed forms. Okay. So then still we describe in terms of basis. Okay. For example, oxygen, for example, take, take, take a normal ferrite oxygen forms a what we call as a phase centered cubic structure there. But all these oxygen atoms need not be touching each other the way we are describing. Okay. So, it depends on what type of inclusions you are having. But let me put it like that, you know, I am not sure whether I am really answering your question. See, thing is that uh, you cannot, re I mean, a structure is a structure. Now, a structure has to be described in terms of a Bravais lattice and a basis. Okay. There are multiple ways in which you can do that particular thing. Okay. That is all about, that is all I, I, I would like to say. I cannot really see you know, how you can say that a close packed structure can be or a loosely packed structure can be put to a close packed structure because structure is its own self. See, packing is very, very different from the geometrical aspect. When I am talking of the lattice and uh, the basis, I am more or less looking at its geometrical aspects. All right. So, packing, etc., becomes a slightly different question. I am not sure whether I have answered your question. You know, if I have not answered, can you repeat the question what I have not answered? Yeah, my, uh, means that uh, you have shown that non previous lattice, uh, how basis, uh, basis is going to be added, it becomes to be as a previous lattice. That, that particular part in is correct. In that way, in that way, I am uh, asking that uh, non uh, primitive uh, primitive unit cell can be becoming to be as a uh, non primitive unit cell. Okay, okay. In, in, in fact, that okay, sense, okay. Okay. Ba basis is going to be added. Okay. In fact, I do the other way. I take a non. Uh, okay. Uh, what I do a non primitive cell, I convert into what I call as conventional cell by using uh, a basis. Okay. So, for example, a conventional unit cell, let us say when I draw a cube for a body centered cubic, okay, show 8 points at the corner and 1 point at the center, this is not a primitive unit cell, all right, because it contains on the average 2 points, all right. On the other hand, a primitive unit cell should contain only 1 point. 
Now this non-primitive unit cell, I can convert into a primitive unit cell by converting, taking into a basis. That's what precisely I have done. I considered a basis a BCC lattice by taking one atom at the origin, another atom at the body center, and converted this unit cell into a simple cubic unit cell. So I actually converted a non-primitive, which is a conventional unit cell, to a primitive unit cell. So in that sense, you are right. Yeah, second question is uh, yes. that uh, reciprocal um, you have shown that lattice is to be there yeah. is exist then that uh, vectors are having that lattice points are having the identical surroundings that's of, of course of course any lattice has to have that particular quality so uh, reciprocal lattice is also a brave lattice let's be very clear okay so this translation vector will generate a brave lattice okay which is has exactly the same quality, same quality it has to have exactly the same environment otherwise it's no longer a brave lattice that's perfectly right good evening sir sir uh, my question is sir we are having the uh, direct lattice as uh, simple cubic as a uh, reciprocal uh, lattice as uh, simple cubic that's right for bcc we are having reciprocal bcc uh, fcc, FCC yes. for fcc we are ha having the bcc yeah, right sir yes, so right. Uh, why uh, there is a difference for the bcc as a fcc reciprocal lattice for uh, fcc uh, as a bcc uh, in simple uh, simple cubic we are having the direct lattice uh, same as reciprocal lattice. See, the, why is a difficult question? Because the thing is that that's what we get it. Okay, when there is no, okay, I mean, uh, we have defined it in a particular fashion and eventually we have got it. So, I mean, it's very difficult to say why, you know, because we have obtained it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the why question is a little difficult question. But, you know, of course, one could get surprised why it happens right, uh, that way. Uh, if you want to go into little intricate, uh, intricacies of that, it's a little more complex. It requires a little bit of visualization. In fact, what you can do, if you look at the simple cubic lattice, in fact, see, we said that certain type of reflections are absent, okay, in um, X-ray diffraction. See, for example, you start with a simple cubic lattice and start omitting those points. Take one origin and take the coordinates of all these points and start omitting those points for which H plus K plus L is odd. You take only those points H plus K plus L is even. You will find that this lattice gets converted into one of the lattices. So these things have little more if you want to look into some sort of thought process, you can sort of visualize why it should happen like that. But we cannot really answer why does it happen. It happens because it happens. Because from our definition we get it. Sir, uh, one more question is yes. that what is the meaning of packing fraction? Okay, packing fraction essentially means that total volume which is occupied divided by the total volume available. For example, if, if I take for example, let's say body centered cubic lattice, in a body centered cubic lattice, you know, if I take a unit cell, conventional unit cell, okay, you have points here, you have point here. Okay. Now, total volume of this particular unit cell is A cube. Okay. Now, let us assume that these are, we are having hard spheres which are making this particular lattice. Okay. So, at these points, all these things are hard spheres. So, let us uh, find it out how many number of what is the volume which is occupied. Now, all these 8 corner atoms will contribute on the average 1 atom in this unit cell because each one of them is being shared by 8 cubes and there are 8 such, such corners. Okay, if you take one this, there will be 1, 2, 3, 4 and 4 on the top, there will be 8 cubes which will be sharing this particular corner. Okay, so And there are 8 such, so you have only 1 plus you have 1 at the center, so you have total volume which will be occupied as 2 multiplied by 4 by 3 pi r cube. Okay, so this will be what we will call as a packing fraction. Of course, in order that you calculate the packing fraction, you should know the relationship between r and a. So you should know which is the nearest neighbors. Okay, If you take this particular atom and this particular atom, Okay, the distance between them is A. On the other hand, if you take this particular atom, which is the body center and this particular thing, the distance is root 3A by 2. Okay, because this distance body diagonal is root 3A. So, distance between this atom and this atom or this point and this point is root 3A by 2. Root 3A is 1.732. So, this distance is smaller. So, if I really put spheres here, this sphere will touch this sphere and this will touch this sphere. But this will not touch this. There will be a small gap between these two. Okay. So, you can calculate what will be the R and versus A, versus A relationship because root 3A by 2, okay, this is the distance between them, this must be equal to 2R because there will be 1 R here and there will be 1 R here. So, you find out the relationship between R and A, substitute it here, you will get the packing fraction. So this basically tells you how much of the space is occupied within a unit cell okay, in comparison to the total space which is available. 
think that's close enough. We already more than one. Meet after lunch. Thank you. Thank you.